You know, sometimes I think that my videos about Catherine the Great make it seem that I don't like her. Well, that's not true. I think she was quite a good empress, but it doesn't mean that she was perfect. Read in the program. I'm Russian, and I want to tell my tales from the Russian point of view, because we also want to be heard. And recently, I've noticed one very interesting thing, and that is, no matter Russian or foreign show, Catherine the Great is always depicted as a good mother. But as sad as it is, unfortunately, she wasn't. Many believe that the reason why Catherine the Great never really developed feelings towards her son is because the baby boy was taken away right after his birth. At that time, back in 1754, Catherine was only the wife of future emperor, and all the power was in the hands of Empress Yezaveta Petrovna. She never had children, well, officially that is, so she decided to raise Pavel as her own child. So it is possible that Catherine indeed never managed to develop any motherly feelings towards her son. After all, there are quite a lot of parents who never managed to develop special connection with their children, who did that at a later time. However, I should mention that Catherine also had an illegitimate child, Alexei Bogolinsky, whom she also never got to raise, because at the time she was still married to Peter III. But they weren't... well, doing things that are necessary to produce a child. So, in order to avoid scandal, she gave the baby away. But despite that, she clearly had warm feelings toward this child. So she was clearly capable of loving a child that was away from her. She just didn't like Pavel in particular. I also read Catherine's memoirs to make sure that my suspicions are indeed correct. And I'm afraid they are. She spends several pages talking about the night of childbirth. She talks about her pain and suffering and how she was ignored, and don't get me wrong, this is so horrible, but she never mentions her child. She spends more time describing jewelry she received for the birth than she does describing her own baby. The next time she even mentions Pyro is a little sentence, a semicolon away from her lamenting that her husband is dating the ugliest of her ladies-in-waiting. And what does she say? Well, right after talking about her son's christening, she casually mentions that he almost died from candidiasis. And that's it. No reactions, no thoughts, no expressions of fear. I mean, I get that at the time she couldn't ask about his health, because that would mean she's doubting Empress's ability to take care of the baby. But Catherine's writing her memoir when Elizaveta Petrovna is already dead. Nobody's going to snitch. Why not write about her feelings? What did she feel? What did she feel about the baby? Was she horrified? What did she think? But there is... nothing. And maybe that's what she felt. Nothing. But regardless, in 1762, Empress Elizabeth Petrovna died, which means that Pavel was returned to Catherine. Except, Catherine decided to leave him to the care of his teacher. She had no familial bond with the eight-year-old boy. Soon after, Catherine staged her famous coup that turned her into an empress. As you might imagine, no one was willing to see a German princess with no relationship to Romana family as a sole ruler of the Russian Empire. So she comes to power with a promise. She'll rule until her young son becomes of age, and then she'll transfer the crown to him. The situation only sows the relationship within the two. No one wants to give up their power, and definitely not as great as was now in the hands of Catherine. It is at that point when Pavel stopped being her son and became her rival. And in that war, she didn't hesitate to damage her own image to hurt her son. For example, not only did she support the rumours that Pavel wasn't Peter's son, but she actively participated. In fact, she even stated that in her memoirs, knowing full well that he will definitely see them after her death. She needed those rumours to make Sola see Pyle as a less legitimate heir to the throne, especially now. But many people started to think that there is quite a lot of similarities between Peter III and the Little Prince. But the psychological warfare wasn't the only weapon in Catherine's game. When Pyle was 17, he fell gravely ill. 
So much so that for once Catherine abandoned her governmental duties and stayed by his side. But when Pyle got better, another trouble aroused. Catherine became worried that Pyle was no longer capable of producing an heir, so she decided to have an experiment. She found, as they called her, an agreeable widow, who will later found out was Sofia Ushakova, and gave her a task. And I don't believe I'm saying this, but to seduce a 17-year-old Pavel and get pregnant to make sure that Pavel, in fact, can produce an heir. And just in case you think that it wasn't as bad because she was 25 and Pavel was a boy and it's clearly not as bad when it happens to a boy, sarcasm, then remember that, one, if it were to happen today, Sophia would be charged with statutory or word, and two, Pavel was a completely sheltered kid. Only a select few people were able to see Pavel, so clearly he didn't have a lot of romantic experience, not to mention a more physical one. So I don't think that having your first girlfriend be someone who's clearly tasked to be impregnated by you is very healthy for one's mental state. Not to mention that we don't know how Sofia Shakova reacted to the situation herself. Because no matter how liberated are you, you clearly don't have a say when an empress orders you to do something. So it's quite possible that this experience was quite traumatic for her as well. Oh, and they did in fact have a child together which Catherine took away to raise herself. Because that worked wonders for her. But what was important for Catherine is that Pavel was prone to be able to produce an heir. Which means he was married off quite soon after. But... Before we talk about that, I want to mention one little thing. So, back in those days, there wasn't really an age when you become of age. And one of the ways your legal status was determined was whether or not you were married. And now that Pyle was in fact married, he was of age to become a ruler. And so, a week after he got married, Catherine made Pavel give up, and that seems to be mentioned only in Russian text that she made him give up the rights to schleswig holstein Duchy, which he inherited from his father on his paternal side. In return, he received some territories in Germany, but soon after had to give them up as well and never received anything in return. Obviously, there was a bigger political reason for Catherine to do that, but I can't help but wonder if it's really just a coincidence that he had to give them up so soon after being able to actually rule them. Not to mention that it was the last connection he had with his father, whom he actually loved, and Catherine hated. Catherine ordering to kill Peter III was the last tool that ruined the relationship between her and Pavel. But let's go back to Pavel's first marriage, and let me tell you, it wasn't pretty. Pavel's first wife received the name Natalia Alexeyevna, and she was very ambitious, which is not bad by itself. But it is bad when your ambitions turn you into an abusive spouse. It was pretty obvious that Pavel was in love with his wife, but Natalia wasn't so much. In fact, she used her power over her husband in order to further isolate him from his already very small circle of people, and would only allow a select few to talk to him. She was also very good at gaslighting. For example, despite having an affair with Pavel's best friend, Andrei Rozumovsky, she would pin all the rumours about them on Catherine, knowing about the strained relationship the mother and son had. Not sure if it's appropriate to say fortunately, but Natalia died quite young during childbirth. Pavel was grieving so much that he lost the ability to speak, but Catherine had other plans. She couldn't just let Pavel grieve, she wanted to get him married once again as soon as possible. So what does she do? Well, she gave him letters that incriminated his wife and best friend. This means not only that Catherine knew about Natalia and Andrei having an affair, but she also probably knew that Natalia's baby wasn't Pavel's. But she was still willing to let this go, despite having that god-awful test with impregnating other woman. What kind of mother was she? And, of course, Pavel's heart was broken, but, oh well, no time to cry. There is a wedding at the horizon. And, I'm not even exaggerating, Natalia died in April and Pavel's second wedding was in September of the same year. At the very least, his second wife was a nice person. 
And something not so funny about the wedding. Both of Pavel's weddings were in September, specifically so that people wouldn't remember about Pavel's birthday. Remember that Catherine was supposed to rule until her son becomes of age, and she didn't actually want people to remember that he did become of age. But anyway, Pavel's second wife, now known as Maria Fyodorovna, actually had a very good relationship. And they had ten children together, none of whom survived. But just because Pearl found a loving family didn't mean that Catherine stopped causing him troubles. For example, let's talk about the place where the young couple had to live. Since Catherine realized that she and her son have a vastly different political views, she decided to kick him out of St. Petersburg to make sure that he didn't intervene in her policies. So she gifted Pearl a place to stay in known as Gatchina. And Gatchina used to be owned by Gregory Arlov, who wasn't just Catherine's ex lover, <laughs> no, that would be one thing, but he was also one of the people who killed Pavel's father. Surely Russia is big enough to find Pavel a place that wasn't owned by his father's murderer. Why give him Gatchina of all places? At least he ended up liking the place, and I feel like it's the slogan for Pavel's life, at least he ended up liking it. But putting Pavel and his wife in the murder estate wasn't just the only thing that Catherine did. She intervened in pretty much every state of Pavel's family life. For example, Pavel and Maria were able to name only one of their children, Mikhail, who was born after the death of Catherine the Great. And he was also the only child whom she didn't take away from the parents. Most people think that Catherine only took Pavel's two oldest sons, Alexander and Constantine. But she actually took Nikolai as well. It just so happens that she died quite soon after, and so the boy was returned to his family. But as I said, the two oldest boys were raised the way Catherine wanted them to be, and it wasn't a secret that Catherine wanted Alexander to inherit the throne, not her own son. She even named her oldest grandson Alexander, in honor of Alexander the Great, the famous ruler of the ancient Greece. And even though her plans didn't come true, and Pavel did indeed come to rule Russia after her death. It is believed that she was a spiritual influence behind Pavel's violent matter, as she raised the two oldest boys to despise their father and see him as a worthless ruler. By the way, many modern historians believe that he wasn't as bad of a ruler as he was originally portrayed. He gave more freedom to peasants and restricted the rights of aristocracy, and only a crazy person would do that, right? And as a little cherry on top of that already rotten pie, Catherine was pissed off every time Maria Fyodorovna gave birth to a baby girl. I mean, I get that she was concerned they wouldn't be able to find proper spouses for the girls, but you don't have to be hateful about it. The oldest daughter, Alexandra, had it especially bad, but that's a story for another day. As for Pavel, I really think that he didn't really have a chance to have a good relationship with his mother. Back in the 18th century, it seems that everyone knew the sad story. He was even nicknamed the Russian Hamlet. And now you know that story as well. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for listening and subscribe if you want to know more about Russia and Russian history. Thanks for listening. Пока-пока.